Hello, everybody. We're about to get started. So if you want to take your seat, it's OK. I'll wait for you. We're in no rush. I think it's lunchtime after this, right? It is? Oh, I'll be quick. So let's talk about the Universal Windows platform. So Larry talked a lot about the work we've done to make sure that we unify the platforms that we have. I'm going to go with more details on what, it, what can you do and what the work that we've done into the XAML platform and all the other platforms to make it easier for you to develop across all the different platforms, all different devices. Now, I want to show this slide really quickly because this illustrates the vast amount of devices that your application can run on. Just imagine having your application run on all the way from the smallest little device that a user might use all the way to the biggest one. Your application is going to be in your user's hands for the entire day that they're using it, from the time they get up to the time that they go to bed. So this is going to be an application that can run across many different, plat many different devices, many different form factors. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we make sure that we make this easy for developers to make these applications, for them to create these uh, experiences on many different devices. And to do that, we've uh, also wanted to make sure that because these are different devices, they have some unique features that these devices might want to, developers might want to take advantage of. Not all devices will be used the same way. We want to make sure that we give you the ability for you to choose how this device is going to be used and make your experiences adapted to the device they're using. So some devices belong to the devices for IoT. So they are little devices that kind of run in the background. They don't have, really have a screen most of the time. They kind of just do some kind of processing, maybe turn some lights on. It's all about hardware. Then we have the mobile devices, like phones and tablets, the PC devices, like laptops and desktops, the Xbox that's also coming to the platform, the Surface Hub, and also the HoloLens. And when we're creating this platform, we wanted to make sure that all, all the services and everything in the right for these devices is unified. So you create one user interface that's adaptive across all this platform, but yet you keep in mind the experience and you adapt that experience as well to those platforms. We've added a lot of new natural user interfaces. And I actually have a talk later on today on more personal computing. It talks about all the inputs and outputs we've added to the platform to make it more personal. We have one development environment, one store, and one way to and, and wait for you to reuse code across all the different devices, even from before. Now, this is a little architecture of what the platform looks right now for development. And I'm sure you've probably seen this before. How many people have seen this before? OK, most like half of you. So you can see that we have the Windows kernel on top of it. What we've created and we've kind of evolved all the way from Windows 8.1 and 8.0 is the Windows Universal Platform, which is built on top of the Windows runtime. So this is a Windows Universal Platform that runs across all these devices that I showed you the picture. This is the same runtime that runs everywhere. And on top of this runtime, you can access it with many different languages and the tools that you want to choose. We, you can access them through C Sharp, Visual Basic, C, C++, all the native languages. And you can do the UI in XAML and DirectX, up to you. And we also have the ability for you to do it in, in JavaScript and the HTML and CSS by taking the Edge HTML engine that's part of the Microsoft Edge platform that runs on side of uh, Universal Platform. And with the introduction to Windows 10, we also announced and we created a lot of new platform features that you can take advantage of into your applications to light up new features, new, uh, new scenarios. So I want to take maybe a couple hours to kind of go through each one of these. And let's start with gesture, gaze, and hologram. We're kind of just going to laugh around all of them. Does that sound good? No? <laughs> no we're not going to do that. That's way too many. No, I'm going to do that. Um, what I want to start with first, though, is I want to go through a, a simple demo of how to get started with Visual Studio, creating your first project, and kind of deploying it to multiple devices. So let's go ahead and do that. So I have Visual Studio open. And I'm going to create a new project. So this is Visual Studio 2015. You can get it for free uh, online right now, the Community Edition. I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to go to Universal Platform. We have this new option here called Universal. And you can see we have a, a blank app, which is the one I'm going to select right now. I'm going to give it a very unique name of App 5. That's my app name that I choose. And I'm going to create a project. 
uh, Visual Studio is going to go ahead and, and put everything in for me in the project. So this is going to be familiar to you if you've done any kind of Windows app development in the past. So that's it. Now I'm not going to run it. Let's go ahead and add some UI to this. So I'm going to open the XAML page. There we go. I'm going to add a quick image and a text. I actually already have the code. I'm not going to have you watch me code. There we go. Now this is, I'm adding an image. Oops. I'm adding an image, and I'm adding some text. I also need to add a little quick image real quick to my project. That way, we're going to make this easier for us. There we go. That's it. Now, this is just an image that's full screen, also a text block, very easy. Let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. There it is. It's just Larry. <laughs> I stole this picture from Twitter. I hope he doesn't get mad. OK, we're good. Now, this is Universal App, so you can actually run this on multiple devices. Now, I have a, a, a Lumia 950 XL with me. So let's go ahead and run this on the 950 XL. So what we've added to the platform now, you can actually switch between which device you want to run this on. So if I switch the architecture to this to be ARM, because the phone is running ARM, you can do that right here. And you can notice here, we actually have a little drop down that allows us to, to deploy this to multiple devices. Now, ARM can only deploy to devices like mobile. But if I leave this to x86, for example, and I use the drop down, you'll see we have more devices that you can actually deploy this application to. It has some mobile emulators for the phone. You can remote deploy this to a remote device somewhere, deploy it to a simulator, devices that support the platform. If you want to deploy it to an IoT device, you can use the remote machine option, and it will deploy it to a Raspberry Pi, for example. Now let's go ahead and deploy it to the phone, just so you can see this working, that I'm not lying. And there was errors. Oh, that's because I haven't connected the phone. So old pro tip, expert tip, is always connect your phone to deploy apps to the phone. Not everybody knows that. And you have to turn the USB three times before it goes in. Now, everyone remember that. There it is. So now it's going to deploy to the phone. It's going to pull all the references and everything it needs to package up the application. Now, I don't have project my screen, but you're going to have to all kind of come down here and I'll kind of look at the phone real quick you know, while it's deploying. Okay. This is exciting, right? You're waiting. It's going to come. It's going to get there. We can do this. Did you guys try out the new phones? Who didn't try it out? We tried it out. Awesome. You should try check it out. We have the 950s and the 950XL and Continuum right there. It's 16 megabytes. It's a lot of data to transfer over. <laughs> this only happens the first time you do it. I should have actually redeployed the app before. So, OK, finally, here we go. OK, there it is, the same application. There it is, and that's Larry again. Says hi. Hey, si say hi, everybody. Hi, there we go. I also wanted to kind of make this fun a bit and make sure that it's not just a simple Hello World application. So I'm going to add a few more features to this. I want to make it kind of bright and flashy. So I'm going to add, make it flash a bit. So I'm going to add a little animation to it, just so you know, kind of 
see whether it actually works. So we're just going to change the color of the background. And I need to add some code as well to the main page. So I added a storyboard. The storyboard is used to modify a property of an element and apply some time to it so that we can create some animations, move things around, translate, change colors, etc. So that's what the storyboard is used for. And what I need to do is, in the code behind of this application, I just need to start. So I'm just going to add on the on active, uh, on navigated to mo method, I'm going to start the storyboard. So I call it celebrate. I'm going to say begin, and it's going to start. That's it, very simple. Let's go ahead and run this on PC now. We're going to be done with the phone for today. There it is. It's clicking. Awesome. Do you guys like that? Yeah? OK. So it's very simple to, as you see, to just create a new application. Of course, your application is not going to be that uh, complicated. Your application will be way simpler than that. I just you know, spent a lot of time building that. And you know, if you want to download it at the store today, you can do that. There's an in-app purchase to add some music to it as well. So if you want to spend the $2 to add the music, you can do that as well. Now, for the rest of the day, we're going to talk about five things. We're going to talk about what are the new things we've added to XAML, what are the new things we added to the platform for performance to increase the performance of your applications, how we've improved the tools, how we've improved the app model, and finally, how we've added native compilation to applications to even get more kick out of, uh, of, out of your apps. So let's talk about XAML. So we've added a lot of new controls to the platform for you to make it easier for you to develop applications across many different devices. Um, develop the panel, for example, is used to easily relate elements one to another. But what's more interesting about this is you can easily change the layout of elements when you switch between different sizes. The split view is used to kind of hide, and, and, uh, hide and open different menus. And then you might be familiar with the pivot and command bar. And there's a lot more command controls that we've created to the platform to make it easier for you. And you can create your own controls. You have the ability to do that. And because these applications are going to run across multiple screen sizes, multiple, screen, uh, multiple devices, they need to be adaptive, and they need to be smart. So for example, one great example is the Outlook application that runs across phone and desktop right now. When it's at the largest desktop size, you can see it's three columns across. We have some options on, on the left, the email is on the middle, and a specific email is selected on the right. As the size of the application goes smaller, you can see it switches to two-column mode. The options get hidden behind a hamburger button, so the user will have to press the hamburger button. That way, they only see the options they need. When it goes even smaller to, let's say, kind of a, a small tablet or a phone, you can see we only see just one column. And this could be either a list of emails, and when the user presses to an email, the application actually navigates to a different page to show the email. It doesn't show both at the same time. So this is a new way of thinking about how do you create an application that can actually do this instead of creating two different applications. And it's not just about how they look. It's also the experience that they provide. For example, the calendar application looks completely different, even though it's the same application run across a different platform. And that's the reason, the reason behind this is because the use case for users when they use these applications or these devices is different. When they're on the desktop, when they use the calendar applications, they spend a lot of time into this application. They plan their day, they add more items, they change things, they accept meetings. When they use it on the phone, they want to see quickly what their next event is. They're usually not adding new events or inviting people to, to meetings. So that's why when you are in the big screen, you can actually see your whole month, you can actually add, you have more options to add, remove, etc. When you're in the phone mode on a smaller screen, you can actually only see just the list of your next element. So it's also about changing the way that application is being used rather than than being changing at how, it's, how it looks. Now, we've done a lot of work on the platform to enable this automatically for you. I like to call it automagically. It's not a real world word. I invented that word. But it's the ability for the controls that we build to be smart enough to automatically change the behavior depending on the screen size or device they're on. So for example, here we have a pivot. The pivot, when it's on a big device, and then all the little pivot items can actually fit on the screen, it turns into sort of a tab control. So that way, you can actually just tab with your finger or with your mouse on each one. You don't have to do anything. 
as soon as it kind of the size changes to hide some of the items in the pivot, then actually switches to a pivot where actually items actually switch, tabs actually switch. And as soon as you enter a mouse, buttons show up. That's automatically done for you. You don't have to do any of that, et cetera. So this is across many different uh, controls that we do. The, the menus, for example, if it's activated by a button, uh, by a mouse, or if it's activated by a touch, it's different size depending on how the user wants to use it. So we do a lot of that work for you. We also added some new capabilities to the platform to make it easier for you to adapt the UI within your XAML. For example, this is a storyboard uh, that you would write in an 8.1 application. As you can see, and if you've used storyboards before, you know they're not the easiest thing to write by code. Usually you write them with, with uh, Blend or something because they generate a lot of code. You have to kind of figure out how to assign properties, how to change properties over time. It's not the easiest thing to do. What we've added to the platform now is what we call visual state triggers and visual state setters. What this allows you to do is to easily assign values to elements within your visual states. So for example, here you can see that I have a setter. I have a setter that simply sets the value of ispain open to true just by setting that. It's really easy to read and really easy to do. Moreover, what it also does is allows you to, to set a trigger. So something happens in the application. In this case, the width of the application changes. This style will automatically trigger that we don't have to write any code in C sharp. It'll automatically apply the setters for you. You don't have to do anything. And these are some of the adaptive triggers, for example, is some of the triggers that we've already provided in the platform. But you also have the ability to create your own triggers. For example, here's an input type trigger that you could create yourself that essentially changes the view of the application depending on the input device that a user is using. Whether they're using a touch device or they're using a pen device, this trigger will automatically change the UI without you having to do any write, write any code in C Sharp. I actually have a quick demo that I want to show you of an application of an extensible trigger that I've written. Now, I have a quick question for you. Usually when people present, they like to ask questions to involve the audience into the presentation. So this is going to be a very difficult question. Who here is a cat person? Just raise your hand. Who is a cat person? Who likes cats over dogs? Two people, OK. And who's a dog person? More dog people, my people. OK, great. Sorry about your cat people. This demo is around dogs. So I promise if you have you know, some feedback, we might change it to cats later on. So I created this application to kind of play a game called Peekaboo. Peekaboo is essentially you play with babies. You kind of do this to babies, and they kind of laugh, and then you hide, and then they kind of get sad. So here's a little puppy. It's very sad. And what I want to do is when I show my face to the puppy, I want it to go happy. So I can just walk over here, and he can just go happy. I can just hide and show, hey, Peekaboo. Peekaboo! It's happy. So I created a trigger to do this. I didn't have to write any C sharp code in the code behind. I just have to write this trigger and I can reuse across devices. So let me show you how this looks. Here's the trigger that I created. It's essentially a class that extends state trigger base. Right there. It's a new class that we added to the Windows 10 runtime. What you need to do, you can create different modes that you can set within your XAML. I'll show you what that looks like. And essentially what I'm doing is I'm using this new capability into the platform that allows you to detect faces on a camera. It's very easy. It's very easy um, functionality into the platform. It's essentially an effect that gives you an event every time it detects a face. You don't have to write any code. But this is not why I'm showing you this. You can actually have this on, on, um, on GitHub. You can take a look at this. It's all you. But here's what happens is when an event gets fired that a face is detected. I can actually set, call this method called set active to true or false, and that will activate at different states. So how do you use this? If you look at my main page, the XAML, first thing you'll see, I have just an image here that I'm using to set the, the image that, that the user sees. And here's my visual states. I have two states. I have a happy state, and I have a sad state. The happy state has triggers and setters. So a trigger, I'm using my pick trigger, the one that I just created. Very easy. Here's the mode that you saw, the little property. If I switch back, there's a little mode, the property that I created. So here I'm setting the mode to phase detected in the happy state, 
or mode face not detected. It's just a string that you can check within the trigger. And that's it. And then for each one, I set a setter to change the image source. So that way, when my setter detects a face, it switches the image directly to, to, uh, to the happy face or the set face. If you look at my code behind, there's not really any code back to this page. It's just all done through XAML, and then all I have to do is just reuse that trigger. In fact, there's a whole community out there that's created many different triggers that you can use within your application. If you just search on GitHub or on our samples, you can see many different triggers for many different things that you can just reuse. And if you want to use this application, uh, you can find me after this presentation, and for $10, I'll give you the source code. Of course, that's the joke. It's on GitHub. You can use it right now. And we've added many other goodies that I'm not going to go into because of the lack of time. But there's many things we've tried to make easier for you as developers within the XAML platform. One of the most requested things is to get a change notification on a dependency property. So if right now, just to get a simple change notification dependency property, you have to in implement iNotify. You have to implement many different things. And you have to write a lot of boilerplate code just so you can get this. Now you can actually just get an event when a, property on a, when a dependency property changes really easy. And finally, we've added Perspective Transform 3D. Perspective Transform 3D allows you to do very rich 3D animations. You kind of want to do, maybe you want to do a flip page effect. You can really easily do that now with the Perspective Transform 3D within your application. And it's very easy to use, and you have full control of, of camera, et cetera, that gives you this 3D effect. Because, when, because applications now on the desktop are windowed, they're not full screen anymore, we've added the ability for you to customize the Chrome of the application and brand it. To your, to your brand. So you can change the color. You can even extend the view within the actual, uh, within the actual um, title bar, and you can change it completely to look the way you want it to look. And one of my favorite features that has been added to the platform, but it's existed before on, on classical Windows applications, is drag and drop. Drag and drop might not seem something important, but when, when users use your applications, they expect drag and drop to be there. And we've made it really easy for you to add this capability to your applications, to drag images, to drag anything within your application, and make it a better citizen within the rest of the platform. Now, we've done a lot of, a lot of work to the XAML platform, but we've also done a lot of work to make it faster and optimize for your applications to make it easier. We've heard a lot of feedback from developers saying, XAML is great, but it's not the fastest thing out there. And out of the early days when we started creating Windows 10, the first thing, decision that we made is that we're actually going to use XAML within our first party applications. The same XAML, same controls that you guys are using within your applications, we're using ourselves. In fact, the start menu right now, the notification center, that's all written with the same XAML that you're using within your application. This allows us to catch bugs quickly, allows us to see performance issues, and if something's not working, it's not working for us as well, so we're, you know we're going to fix it. So we've done this work to make sure that your application also are as fast as possible. And we've done some testing to see how fast XAML on Windows 10 is compared to previous platforms. And in fact, if you compile like, an application from 8.1 to Windows 10, just without changing anything, hopefully, uh, the, the performance of this application increases. So the CPU performance goes down on applications that are compiled for Windows 10. The working set, the memory, actually decreases as well on applications. And you can see in some cases up to 45% the working set is removed, and CPU is up to 30% in some cases. So just by not doing anything on your applications, you get this better performance. We've also added some capabilities to your platform that have been asked for a very long time. Compiling. Who loves compiling on the platform? Or who's used to compiling on the platform? Not compiling, sorry, binding. Sorry, binding, OK. Few people. Now, who loves binding on the platform, performance-wise? Not that many people. Oh, one person. Great. You don't have to worry about this. <laughs> um, one of the things about binding is that it's amazing. It makes things a lot easier. But it's not the most performant thing. Because it uses reflection and runs in runtime, it slows down your application. So you have very rich pages with a lot of binding on them. It might take a very long time just to get the application to load. So we've introduced a new way to do binding on, the, on Windows 10. It's called compiled binding. And you can do it just by saying xbind. So you can see it here. It says xbind. 
It's different than just binding. What it does is actually compiles the binding logic at compile time. It doesn't run in runtime, so it doesn't use reflections in anything. And the performance benefits of this are amazing. It's almost as if you're not using binding at all. And other benefits of this is that also you can resolve issues at compile time. If something, a data type, is not right and you misspell something, you can actually catch that right now in compile time. You no longer have to run the application and find out that something doesn't work because you, know, you forgot to misspell something. You will catch these errors at runtime. At, at compile time as well. And this is something that was, is being used right now by the Office application, for example. The modern Office application runs on Windows 10. It's using this heavily, and everything is, is very easily done by using XBind. Another feature that people have asked for that has been very popular is being the ability to do progressive rendering, having the freedom to choose which elements get rendered when, so that way your application can show, to, can show up to your user a lot quicker, and it can actually show something relevant instead of just waiting for everything to load. So we've introduced X-Phase. X-Phase allows you to set priorities of how elements render within your data templates. That way, when a huge data template, whole list, loads many different items, maybe you can just show the text or something first and wait for everything to load before you're showing some heavy images. Then when the user gets this visual feedback a lot quicker have, without having to wait for everything to load. And finally, we've also added the ability to do deferred loading, which is completely to render an element or a tree at a different time than load time. So that way you can actually, if a whole tree or a whole element is off the screen, users really don't care about this element. But in a lot of cases, you have to wait for this element to load as well because you might need it later on. In this case, you can defer loading of an element to after everything else has loaded, that give that kick to the user, give that kick to your application to load data much quicker and show something to the user much quicker. And to use these new improvements in performance, we've also done a lot of improvements in Visual Studio to make it easier for you to, to write these applications both performance-wise and also UI-wise and everything. So I'm going to go through several features that, we've, that are my favorite in this. And in fact, Larry Liberman, who was just presenting the keynote this morning, has a whole session after mine talking about many more of these Visual Studio improvements. You should definitely check it out. The first one is we have a new XAML language service. One of the things that, that was bad in the previous, in, previous implementation is that the designer was coupled with the XAML editor. That way, if the designer crashed, you have to wait, and Visual Studio will just kind of hang. Now we've completely decoupled the designer from the editor. You can edit while the designer is doing something. Even if it crashes, you're not affected. We've also built it on top of Roslyn, so we give it that performance and giving all these options that you would get in your C Sharp code. And we're giving a lot more new technologies. And I'll show you a little quick demo in a little bit. Because these applications that you're writing are going to run across many different, uh, different resolutions, we also added the ability for you to visualize what these will look like on different, different uh, resolutions without having to run your applications. And you can actually change code and see what it will look like immediately within the editor and the designer. We've added the ability to modify your XAML or inspect your XAML and properties while your application is running. Now you can simply just select an element on your application while it's running and see the properties about that element in Visual Studio, even change those properties in Visual Studio directly. It makes it a lot easier to identify problems or even design your whole application while the application is running, if you're into that. And finally, we've added more better improved profiling tools to the platform to make it easier for you to find problems and optimize your application really quickly. So to show you these four different features, I'm going to just go back to the same application I showed you before. Right here, left arrow. That was cool. What happened? Narrator hey. settings window. Hi. Tap exiting narrator. That's helpful. Um, here we go. So this is the application. So one of the things I want to show you is some of the, the improvements within to the editor. So one of my favorite features is that I really, really like is adding buttons. Everyone loves to add buttons. So let's say I go ahead and add a button here. Let's go ahead and give it a... An, a handler. Now, what you can do now is you have to switch to code behind to change the code that would execute for this. But we've also added the ability to do pick definition. 
Now you can actually have your C Sharp and your XAML code viewed at the same place. You can actually kind of have them in line and see what happens. So here I can, maybe I want to move the celebration from running from startup to being a button. And maybe I just want to give it a quick name, quick uh, content real quick without actually having to switch back and forth. I can just do it really easily in line. Let's call this celebrate. There we go. I did that without actually switching back to the code behind. And if I run this application, you can see we have a seller button and start celebrating. I'm going to keep showing you this because it's awesome. Another thing that we've done that I've mentioned is the designer. So if you go back to the designer, you can now see that we actually have an option to see what this application will look like on many different devices and sizes and different scales. So if you, like, if you click on here in the left corner on top, you can see we have an option to see what your application will look like on, let's say, on a 5-inch phone, an 8-inch tablet with 125% DPI scale, maybe what it would look like on a Xbox, for example. What would this look like on an IoT device with a 4-inch screen? Yeah, it wouldn't look that great. But you, know, you can actually do this and design your application really easily without having to run them within many different um, devices. Maybe you don't have an IoT device, or Xbox is not yet available. So how do you design for that? Well, you have the ability to actually see what it will look like here into the designer. Another feature, as I mentioned, is the visual tree editor. So if I run this application again, let's celebrate. You can see here we have this thing in Visual Studio, the live visual tree. If I open that real quick, you can see we can see the tree of the application while it's running. And I can actually select elements. So if I press this selection, I can kind of see the little red outline shows up. I can select this whole element and maybe edit this element. So if I go to the Live Property Editor right here, let's hide this real quick. If I go to this, so you can see the properties. Maybe I want to add a new property here. Maybe I want to change the size of the font. Let's see, font size. Let's make it huge, 60. You can see it actually changes it immediately while your application is running. It's much easier to see this issue. You want to change the margin. Maybe you want to see why is this margin not right? Like, what, what happened? What's changing this margin? You can really easily do that just by viewing all these elements. And finally, the last thing I want to show you is the performance tools. So to do that, I'm going to add a little function to my code that essentially calculates pi. And this is a very slow way to calculate pi, let's just say that. So I'm going to not celebrate anymore. Let's add some namespaces. There we go. I'm going to calculate pi to in 10 million iterations and up to 20 digits. Very easy. So I want to show you how you can actually see how your application is running, how fast it's running, how fast some, some uh, functions take, what, how much memory you're using, et cetera. So if I run this application one more time, and I put my breakpoint here, let me hide these things, and let me show you the diagnostic tools. Now, here, the diagnostic tools start running immediately after you start the application. You no longer have to start diagnostic tools uh, separately. You can, they just start running, and they start giving you options, and start giving you events and stuff that are happening. So you can see here, I'm running at about 36 megabytes right now. My CPU is not really using much data. So let's go ahead and press the button. Let's celebrate. There we go. You can see everything froze. You can see we had some garbage collection here, et cetera. If I go to the memory usage tab, I can actually take a snapshot of the memory. Really easy. And you can see I have about 261 objects, et cetera. Let's go ahead and skip over this, this uh, call. Let's see. It's going to do something. You can see here the CPU actually increased and went up to 25% or so. And I can take, now that it's finished, here you can see after the, it finished, you can see it took about four and a half seconds for this to complete. So you get this visually immediately to see how long that, that, that option took. And I can take another snapshot at this point, and I can see the differences. There was nine objects added, maybe 0.18 kilobytes of memory added since last time we took a snapshot. So it's very easy to find problems on this. Now, we've, I've talked a lot about what the improvements we've done in Visual Studio. We've also done a lot of improvements in Blend. Have 
Has anybody used Blend before? Do you guys like Blend? Uh, well, we've done a lot of improvements to Blend. My per I personally use Blend all the time. When it comes to designing UIs and animations, it's probably the best tool out there for XAML. And we've done a lot of work to just to make it easier for developers to use Blend, too. It's a lot of the same services for editors and everything that's in Visual Studio. It's also in Blend now. Before, if you wanted to write code in Blend, you get no IntelliSense, you'll get nothing. It was just basically a dumber than a notepad editor. But now it actually works really, really well. You actually get the same IntelliSense. You can fully create a new project in Blend, write your code, design your code, and actually deploy and everything all through Blend. You get all those different tools. Now, I've talked about having different families for different devices. We have the IoT family of devices, the mobile family of devices. What we've done is, the reason why we've done this is because we want to make sure that each one of these devices get the appropriate, um, get all the features that a user might want of this, but that they might not be appropriate to all the different devices out there. So for example, an IoT device has GI GPIO inputs and outputs, for example. You can, you know, you can connect hardware, et cetera. This doesn't exist on desktop in most cases. This is still on mobile. So how do you access these? So we've created this extension SDKs. They can simply add within your application, just reference them within your application. You can still call into these APIs, but you can be smart about how you access these features. So for example, instead of targeting to check to see if your application runs on an IoT device or a mobile device, you're simply now checking to see if a specific feature exists on that device. It's much richer. For example, you can use the new API information API to check to see if a specific API is available on the de device that your application is running on. This way, to see if the GPIO in, uh, interface is available, go ahead and use it. If it's not, handle that somehow into an application saying, hey, get, run this on a different device. This doesn't run here, et cetera. So you, you're, you're thinking about you're developing applications that might be able to take advantage of many different features, and yet they can still run on these different devices. We've done also a lot of improvements to the app model. Now, if you're not familiar with the app model, it's essentially what defines the app lifecycle of your application. And it's the same now for all the devices out there. Because this is a Windows runtime application, you don't have to worry about how Windows Phone handles suspension versus how desktops handle suspensions. Everything's the same now and handles the same across everywhere. It handles everything from the moment that your application is installed to the moment that your application is hopefully not uninstalled. But it handles how it deals with, with, the, with uh, the data model, how it updates, resource management, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the questions that I get a lot is, well, I already have an 8.1 application for a desktop. Does that mean that my application can run on mobile as well now? Well, no. In order for an application to run across all the different devices, on Windows 10, it has to be built with the universal Windows platform. You cannot run a Windows Phone application on Windows Desktop, for example. Same thing with classic Windows applications. They only run on desktop. They will not run on mobile. If you want them to run on mobile, you will have to recompile for the universal Windows platform. Now, because these applications are running across devices that have different different resources, different memory resources, different CPU resources, and different requirements, we have to be smart about how we handle multitasking. And before, if you knew, we had a lot of requirements on how much CPU time you can use in an application. It was the same for everything. It doesn't matter if it's running on a small little tablet or a huge gaming desktop. You only get about a few seconds every 15 minutes, et cetera, for processing time. We've actually improved a lot on that, and we're a lot smarter on how much time we give you to your background task, depending on what device you're running on. So if you're running on mobile or if you're running on desktop, you'll get different background processing times. We also added some capabilities for you to, to ask for more time. So let's say you're running a navigation application that needs to run in the background. Maybe you need to save a file or something. You can tell the OS, wait, I'm not done. Please give me more time. And the OS can decide on how it handles that. In addition, we've added the ability for new, we've added way many, we have added more triggers to the platform for you to use. We've added many new, many new features. For example, Bluetooth beacons that are available, and we've added many new triggers for you to use in the applications. You can check these out. With unifying the, the, the app model, we've also unified the navigation model. Now, what this means is now when a user press the back button on a mobile device, it's the same. It, look, it works the same way as if they press the back button on desktop. If you actually added a back button to desktop, too, if you use 
uh, a device now, a desktop, a laptop, for example, you notice that the application will have a back button now in the corner of when they're in window mode. And when they're actually in full mode, they'll have the little back button next to the Windows logo. And we've unified the way that navigation works back. And you can take advantage of this really easily with your application. You have to think about what device they're running on. Now, one of the biggest things that we've done, I think, on the platform is, is working out how applications actually work to each other. How do we create a community of applications that can work with one another? And before, in Windows 8.1, we had this ability in some ways. For example, an application could create a deep link. Another application can call into this application by sending this, this uh, activation link. Um, the problem with that was you couldn't get any results back. You didn't know what happened to the other application. The other application had to, didn't know who was the calling application. It was really disconnected. We've created new ways to do this now, and one of them is to do it in foreground, and another way to do it in background. So now an application can call into a different application by using the same way, but expect some results. So think about it this way. Let's say you have a shopping application. You want to take payments. Maybe you don't want to implement payments into your application. Somebody else has already implemented this. You can implement your logic for, for uh, ordering and everything, and then have a different application handle the process, and then return the receipt back to your applications. The user still sees this window within your application, but it's actually somebody else that created it. The other capability is to do it in the background, the ability to create background services that different applications can access into. Think of this as web services on the web, just locally running onto your application. And I actually have a little demo to show you how this looks like on our platform. So here I have an application. I'm going to run it and show you what it looks like. Oops. And I was doing so good until now. There we go. So it's a very simple application, very beautiful UI. You cannot steal this UI. I've actually copyrighted this UI, so it's mine. Anyway, so this allows me to check get employees, so I can look up employees by their ID, for example. Very fake, of course. It's not a real application. But what I show you here is that this didn't, this didn't open a different application. This happened into the application itself. But in fact, what happened is this application acts as a background task of another application to get this data. Didn't implement this logic itself. Somebody else already provided this interface for them. So if you look at this, how this works is if I open up the click handle for that button, here you can see that what we do, we're creating an app service connection. This is the ability for you to call into a different background task that might be on that, on that machine. We give it an employee, we give it the, oops. We give it an app service name, and this is something that the other app service has created, and I'll show you where you, where you specify this. And we also give it a package family name, and I'll show you where this comes as well. So you need to have these two information, these two informations to be able to access some other background tasks from a different application. Once you have that app service, you create a connection, and this is a connection. It's a two-way pipe that you can actually talk to this background service and get data. You make sure that the, it was successful, the connection, that, that it exists, or it's, you can see if it's not installed, or maybe you need to go to the store and to install this application that provides this background task, for example. If it's successful, you essentially create a value set. So this is how you pass the message. It's actually a serialized message. It's all strings. They pass over to the app service connection by send, doing send message async. This sends over a message, and it gets a response back, and then it handles the response. It's essentially, it's just a, it's messaging between back and forth. Here is my background service that I've created that does this. So you can see here I have a, an application, lookup uh, service application. It's, in fact, it's just empty application. It doesn't really do anything. If I open up the main page, you'll see that it's actually empty. It doesn't really do anything. But the interesting part here is if you look at the manifest, I've registered this background task as an app service. You can see here I have a declaration of app service. Here's that name of that app service that I showed before. This is how you access it. Here's the entry point to my background service. And here is that package family name that somebody would need to know to be able to access your background task. Now, the imp imp implementation of the background task is very simple. It's essentially just the background task that implements uh, an app service trigger. An app service trigger, when, once this is created, it gives you a little option to create uh, an event handler. 
this event handler is being used to re receive these requests. Now, once the request is received, you open up the value set of the, of, the caller, of the caller. You read, for example, whatever you need to do. You process it, maybe access a web service, maybe access some database, whatever you need to do. And then you simply send the response back. And that's it. It's very easy to use. And you can, you can imagine this being used across many different ways. For example, if you want to log in with Facebook, you don't have to know how Facebook does its thing. You might be able to just access a background task that they've created and just get the data that you need. Additional things that we, improvements that we've done is, and we've received a lot of feedback from developers, is around li of live tiles and tile templates. Currently, to create these little live tiles, for example, or these uh, tiles, you have to use a certain set of templates that we provided for you. And there's many of them, but honestly, it's annoying how many there are, and you have to choose, and you don't have full control of how they look. What we've done now, and because they run on multiple devices, we've made it more adaptive. So they actually are more adaptive depending on the size they are. But you have now the ability to create your own live tiles by providing an XML language that we've, that we've provided to you. They can say how you want things to be positioned, where you want the pictures to be, et cetera. So you have full control of how these live tiles look. It's not just for tiles. It's also for toast notifications. This is what toast notifications look on 8.1. They're just templates, and they're all almost the same. Now we have the ability to kind of customize what they look like in Windows 10. You use the same XML language you use for live tiles. But you also have the ability to create inputs. And one of the, this is one of my favorite features on phone right now. When I receive a text message, I can immediately respond without opening the messaging app. I can do it immediately with a toast. I can have buttons. I can have system events, snoozing, et cetera, built into the platform all within this XML language that you can do. And what this essentially does is when you do this, when you provide an input, it essentially goes down to a background task that processes the, process the request and gives it back to the user without actually opening the application. It's very quick. Finally, the last thing I want to talk to you about is .NET Native. We, we realize that these are applications that are going to run on many different devices with many different requirements. We wanted to make sure we get the best out of these applications. So we created a way for these applications to be compiled natively for the platform. Even though you're using a managed language, you actually compile them down to, to native. It's, it actually uses a really, run, a really lean runtime of, uh, of the VC++ optimizer. And it doesn't require the .NET framework to actually run. And in fact, all your applications, once you provide them to the store, are compiled for .NET native. And when they go to the, to the user, they're actually .NET native applications. Using .NET native, I want to give you some numbers. Just by using .NET native, in a lot of cases, you get up to 60% CPU savings from cold start. From warm, warm start, is up to 40%, which is still pretty good. And for memory usage, it's 30% less for .NET native applications. So you can actually do this right now within your application. You're compiling with .NET Native. Let me show you how that looks like in Visual Studio. So we'll go back to the Larry application. There it is. In the Solution Explorer, if you go to the properties of an application, in the Build tab, you'll see here we have this option now that says Compile with .NET Native Toolchain. Selecting this essentially compiles your application with .NET Native into native code. They can run onto your application. You can test your application. However, compiling to native, as probably a lot of you know, takes a lot of time. There's a lot of optimization to it. You know, it's the same if you were compiling C++. So you don't want to be doing this all the time. So what we've kind of set by default is, you can see now, I'm, you notice I'm in debug mode. As soon as I switch to release mode, it immediately changes that to compile.NET native. So the idea here is you develop your application. You still get the quick, uh, devel quick development with your debug mode. As soon as you change to release mode, you can test it to make sure everything works right. You can see how, fast, how much faster it is when you run an application. And when you submit to the store, it's a requirement that needs to be compiled with .NET Native. So make sure that you, you do that within your applications. So in summary, I just want to give you a quick summary real quick. 
is my top thing is we're listening. A lot of the work that we've done on Windows 10 is because we've received a lot of feedback from developers. And if you're using Windows 10 right now, we really want your feedback. And we have a whole process of, for, for you to provide this feedback. We do a lot of the work for you in XAML. The, all the controls support different, different uh, screen sizes, different inputs, for example. So take advantage of that. And if you want to create your own, learn from the controls that we've created to see how we've actually done that to take advantage of this. We're using the same XAML controls and still in the XAML platform as you are. So if you know that we get all the performance issues and everything that you are, and we're working on that to make sure that it is good for you as it's good for us. We've done a lot of work to Visual Studio to make it easier for you to create responsive applications and make them very performant. We've unified the app model across all these Windows 10 devices. So you don't have to write multiple. Uh, you have to have many use cases for many different devices. It's just one application. We've created very rich uh, app features, such as app-to-app -app communications that make it easier for you to communicate with different applications. And we've added native compilation for your applications to make it even easier and faster for your applications. So thank you for, uh, for attending. Thank you. Most of the code I showed is on my GitHub. So if you want to play around with it, make sure you get that on GitHub. And if you have any questions, I'm sure we can Take some questions now. No? OK. Well, thanks, guys.